and being recorded. Excellent. Okay, this means I have to remember to turn off chat. Um, because otherwise, as I always say, I will just get too involved with you guys. Okay, well, welcome to History Matters and So Does Coffee. Um, a kind of coffee I'm not excited about this morning, but it's still caffeine, so I'm drinking it. Um, welcome. Uh, so today, as I tweeted out, we're going to be talking about, um, in one way or another, congressional representation. Um, and there's a document I'm just going to use to mention it, but I'll really be talking more broadly about it. However, before I plunge into broadly talking about congressional representation, I turn to Grace, who will explain the rules of the game. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us on this chilly morning where most of us live. Um, we're delighted that Joanne can be with us today to talk about congressional representation. I'm Grace Leatherman. I'm the executive director of the National Council for History Education. Uh, we provide professional learning for educators all over the country and, and history enthusiasts as well. So we're delighted that you could join us. If you like this programming, please check out our other offerings at ncheteach.org. We do have a wonderful conference coming up. So do check that out at ncheteach.org slash conference. And we're so delighted to have you here this morning. We want you participating. Do participate in the chat. Chat with each other. Let us know what you're thinking. But if you do have questions for Joanne, please be sure to put them in the Q&A so that we're sure that I notice them and that I'm able to ask those. Uh, please keep everything family friendly. We've got all kinds of people joining us here today. But we are so excited about everything that Joanne has to share. So with that, take it away, Joanne. Okay, excellent. She <laughs> toppled her camera immediately at that moment. Wonderful. Okay. Um, well, uh, as advertised, and I will say uh, thank you to Carolee for providing the numbers since I apparently cannot remember numbers at all. Um, this is the 94th episode. 94. Um, and every week I know I, I sort of say, wow, but that's because every week I'm stunned. 94th episode. Um, Today, I do want to talk about congressional representation. Um, as ever, you know, I have to say 94 episodes. So 94 times I've thought of something to talk about. And it's not always easy. And sometimes it's related to what's happening in the news. Sometimes it's kind of related. Sometimes it actually isn't at all. In the case of this week, um, obviously, what was at the front of my brain, as probably so many of you as well, is voting rights and the importance of voting rights. Um, but I've talked about elections, I've talked about voting, I've talked about many related things. Um, I've talked a little bit about representation, but not in the way that I want to talk about it today. And I do actually now have to go back <laughs> and funnel through the episode. Like, have I talked about this before? When I did, what did I say? Um, so I'm trying really hard to always have original content for you. Um, but I do want to talk about representation because um, even as you can say and should say that elections, free and fair elections are at the core of our political system. Um, James Madison, when speaking about what he called the pivot of our, the structure of our politics, it was representation that he pointed to. He basically was trying to explain what is different about our republic from other republics, particularly ancient republics, or as he put it, pure democracies um, in which everyone took part and there wasn't representation. That in his mind was the, the pivot, the, the distinctive thing about the American political system that made it different and in his mind made it more likely to function and to function well. So that's what I wanna talk about today, not unrelated um, to voting rights, um, but really focused on what should be happening in Congress, what does happen in Congress, um, and why it matters. Now, I, I want to start, there is a document I want to mention, which I've used before, and I'll mention that in a moment. I used it in a different context, and I checked. Um, there's an anecdote, which I'm sure I've mentioned before, but um, if I have, you're going to have to hear it again, because it's, uh, to me, a very revealing anecdote about people in the first Congress, within the first year or two of the government being uh, in effect, the new national government under the constitution. Um, and there were two senators trying essentially to figure out what they're supposed to be doing in the Senate. Like, what does it mean to be a representative? And this particular debate 
grew out of a discussion of what their salaries should be, right? Surprise! First Congress, first Senate, let's talk about salaries. And in and of itself, there's a humor to that, but the debate with, and what became an argument was actually about who is a senator in relation to the populace and in relation to his constituents. So um, Robert Morris and William McClay, and I talk about William McClay a lot because he has this amazing, amazing diary. And I know I talked about his diary way back, like 90 weeks ago. Um, but in this case, Morris and McClay, two senators from Pennsylvania, um, and uh, Morris wants a high salary for senators. Why? Because he thinks that senators should be living in a grand style, grander than the people they represent because as representatives, they are supposed to be put in that office because they are superior and they can see things in a more elevated view and they are more educated and they are basically above their constituents, not necessarily directly representing what they are, but representing their interests because of their stellar insight and their intelligence and their education and everything else that you're supposed to have if you're elite in this time period. So Morris, we need a high salary for that reason because then we can have nice lodgings that we live in and we can live in style as someone should who is representing the people from this grand point of view. William McClay, who's a much more down to earth sort of individual immediately says, basically in modern parlance, are you joking? <laughs> Like, are you kidding? What we're supposed to be doing is representing the, the people who we literally and figuratively represent. We are supposed to be them, basically. We are supposed to reflect them in a very real way. We're not supposed to be above them. We shouldn't have some grand salary. That makes no sense. That's not what a representative of the people is. That's a fascinating conversation to me, debate which we have because McClay put it in his diary. Fascinating because within the very early, early moments of the government, already you have people debating what, what does it mean in this case to be a senator, but more broadly, what does it mean to be a representative of the people? And of course, this is an age, and I've said this many times, right? I said many, many, many times, there is no founder blob. There is no like the founder's thought kind of generality that you can make, nor can you directly transplant things that happened in that period, poof, into the present and say, and thus, you can immediately see. On the other hand, what you can say is that they were worried about and arguing about representation in that period because it's a significant, and as Madison put it, pivotal, a pivoting part of our system. That's what that story shows, is people trying to figure out what representation means. Now, um, and he talks about that at length, I should say. I think that pivot quote comes from Federalist 63, if you're intrigued. Uh, that's where he talks about ancient republics and, and modern republics and representation being the difference and pure democracy. So, you know, in the recent past, I did talk about republic versus democracy. He addresses that in um, Federalist 63, in which he says, pure democracy is everybody taking part. A republic, which is a democratic form of government, is based on representation. But so that's the broader question, right? What are you supposed to be doing in Congress? And I mean that in many different senses of the word. What is a member of Congress supposed to do? Are they supposed to be there sort of in a superior position with insights that the average public doesn't have thinking for them, but not necessarily thinking of what they themselves might want? Or are they really supposed to be focused on the interests and demands and needs and wants of their constituents in a more direct kind of a way. Obviously, I think over time, that question has been answered in a different way, um, different moments, different people, different states, different issues. There hasn't been one direct answer, but right now we have a really interesting moment with some really interesting models of what it means to be representative. I'm gonna come back to that momentarily. What, what, representative, what representatives are doing, what are they representing? And what is the connection between that and the constituents who supposedly have put them in Congress to represent their interests? 
the document I want to address because, uh, and I've used it, I used it um, this over here, let me put this over here. I use it, I believe the second week of History Matters. So a thousand years ago. Um, and I use it to talk about, at the time, about feelings and emotion and the significance of feelings and emotion as historical evidence and in the realm of politics. And I've addressed that in one way or another many, many weeks, partly because it's something I'm really inherently interested in, uh, is the fact that we kind of either don't think about human emotion as historical evidence or we take it for granted. But the fact of the matter is, and it's, it's almost, you know, feels almost that you don't need to say it, that emotion guides our actions. That in one way or another, that's always been true. Emotions change, context change, lots of things change, but the role and impact of emotion on politics to me is always fascinating. So this document um, I found and used in my most recent book, Lurking Over My Shoulder, um, because of what it says about feelings, but it also says something interesting to me about representation and how that works. And it's a document um, written in 1874. Um, and those of you who might remember, it's written by three senators um, who were being were upset, beyond upset, at the fact that Southerners in the 1850s, the mid and late 1850s, were silencing Northerners by threatening them and insulting them, and in one way or another, intimidating them so that they would either never stand up or back down in one way or another, silence or compliance in one way or another. That's what the Southerners were trying to force upon Northerners. Now in the mid and late 1850s, you have the brand new Republican party, which is a Northern anti-slavery party. And I've talked about before and won't go into now how that fundamentally changes the dynamic of Congress because suddenly you have people who are willing to be more aggressive, in some cases, even willing to physically fight, uh, and in some cases, even elected into office because they're that kind of guy. So the dynamic is really changing. But that said, there's still this overall dynamic of Southerners trying to silence Northerners in Congress. This document was kind of a Hosanna document to me because it attested to the importance of emotion in Congress and the ways in which it shaped events. Um, there were three members of Congress, three senators who signed it, Simon Cameron, Benjamin Franklin Wade, and Zachariah Chandler, three Republicans. And I won't go, I won't read, I have the, actually I have the, the transcript of the document, but then I have the, um, the copy of the document. Um, what the document explains is why they decided back in the 1850s that the next time a Southerner insulted them, I, any one of them, they were no longer gonna back down, that they'd had enough. And they explain in this document um, all of the reasons why they could no longer stomach that kind of behavior. I'll read a little bit of this. Um, During the two or three years preceding the outbreak of the slaveholders rebellion, the people of the free state suffered a deep humiliation because of the abuse heaped upon their representatives in both houses of Congress. This gross personal abuse was borne by many because the public sentiment of their section, Northern, the Northern section of the Union, would have fallen with crushing severity upon them if they had resorted in the only manner in which it could be effectively met and stopped by the personal punishment of their insulters, meaning a duel or physical force and what this memorandum, which all three men ultimately sign, are saying in the North, they would not have been thrilled with us, either to fight a duel or, or whether you know we sort of personally, physically, aggressively punished them in some way that in our mind lived up to the ugliness of this moment. And they then describe one, as they put it, noted occasion um, in which there were such horrible insults that were being offered against the Republicans that these three men decided that they needed to do something. They described being, quote, frantic with rage and shame. That's, that's the document that, that's the phrase that, that really made this document so amazing to me in the phase, early phases of writing my book, because if you're looking for emotion as a way of shaping politics, there you have it, frantic with rage and shame. But what they say, these three men, is they decided that their constituents, we're not being 
properly represented in Congress. Um, they say the undersigned, those three men, felt themselves forced to do something to vindicate themselves and their constituents, threatened through these means, these insults, with a denial of equal representation in the Senate. So they're being insulted. They're, people are attempting to silence them or, or threaten them into not putting up any kind of a protest. And their response to that, first of all, it's this is humiliating and it angers them. And they talk about their later on in the statement, their manhood being attacked. But also they say more than once, the next paragraph says our constituents were well nigh deprived of their representative rights in Congress by the insolence of our political opponents. So on a very basic level, what the statement is saying, in addition to all of the emotional components in it, is because we were being allegedly threatened and attacked so that we would not stand up, our constituents were being denied their representative rights in Congress. We could not properly represent them. And that's our job is to be able to stand up and say what we think on their behalf. And because of the bullying in Congress, we and many others like us, in one way or another, we're censoring ourselves to avoid that kind of a situation. So what this statement, the reason why it was written, first of all, it's written in 1874. So they're looking back and explaining why they did what they did. What they end up doing is vowing, taking a, a mutual oath, these three men, that the next time a Southerner or a slaveholder attacks one of them in this way, that they will stand up to it and they will fight back, potentially fight a duel, and to use their phrase, to carry the quarrel into a coffin. We will fight to the death. We're tired of our manhood being insulted and we're tired of our constituents not having their due representation in Congress because we're, many of us, Northern Republicans are afraid to stand up and say something against these bullying Southerners. So this, this document for a whole bunch of reasons I love, um, but in and of itself, that statement, if we can't stand up freely and speak here, then the representative rights of our constituents are not being met. So in this case, we must, must do something really dramatic, which is willingly fight to the coffin to defend the representative rights of our constituents. Now in the, in the um, book in which I explore this, I, I talk about the fact that um, people, representatives, and certainly in this era, at least, felt very much that the way that they were treated in Congress was bound up with how their constituents and state and section of the union were being viewed. So if you humiliated a member of Congress from Ohio, you were humiliating Ohio in one way or another. So there was, the personal component was very political and public as well. But the significant part of that statement to me was because we're afraid to stand up, our constituents are being deprived of their representative rights. That's what's supposed to be happening in Congress, right? We're supposed to be able to stand up here and represent what we believe their interests or, or demands or needs to be. Again, going back to where I started with um, uh, McClay and his diary uh, and Morris, we can still debate and, and in some ways, different people had different models of understanding what it meant to represent your constituents, but in one way or another, that's at the core, representing your constituents. Now, I bring that up because, um, and at some point when I was trying to figure out today what I wanted to say, um, I wrote this statement down, which I think partly captures some of what I'm trying to get at here. Your base is not the same thing as your constituency, right? We talk about people appealing to the base and it can be the same. You know, I mean, your, your, your base, your personal base can be your constituents. But when we talk about people appealing to the base, often these days we're talking about people, often people on the right, making very aggressive, strident statements aimed at getting attention to appeal to the base of people who want and need that kind of a statement. So in that case, base is not just your constituents. Base is the people who we want to keep on open and alert and alive so that we can stay in power. That's a different thing than representing the rights and um, interests and demands of your constituents. 
it's a different kind of, of representation in a sense. It's it's party politics rather than um, the sort of pivoting mode of politics that James Madison talked about, right? Appealing to the base. Now, that's not to say that if you look over time at Congress and how it operates, that there haven't been moments when members of Congress have not been performative to appeal to a broad public, to, to promote their party, to attack another party. Of course, all of those things have happened over time. There's a performative component to being a member of Congress. That's also been true from the very beginning. It's why initially, one of the reasons why initially there was so much debate over whether the press should or should not be in the, the House and the Senate, particularly the Senate, revealing to the public what's going on because the public should know what's going on because the public put people there to do things for them. And if they, they need to know what their representatives are doing so that if they don't like what they're doing, they can take them out of office and through a free and fair election, put somebody else in. So what we're seeing now is not necessarily, you know, as a, as a historian, um, I'm, I'm very wary of saying new or unprecedented because Nothing, <laughs> almost nothing is unprecedented. Maybe combinations of things are unprecedented, but if you're talking about um, unrepresentative politics, um, people asserting party over country, um, ugliness, violence, people being cut out of the political process, attacks on voting rights, none of that is new, right? None of that is new, and we all know that. What we're looking at now in this particular moment with our particular set of problems is just a, a particular playing out of that spiral of ugliness. Voting rights is part of that. Um, obviously, elections and who we put into Congress is a vital part of whatever representation is. But we're seeing a lot these days of people who clearly see a, as a major part of their role in Congress being to appeal to the base. And I don't know, you know, I, I have not looked to see what else these people might be doing in Congress, um, but some of them, it appears to be that their primary activities these days is to say and do things that are very aggressive and very extreme to get people riled up and emotional, right? This gets back to my favorite topic, to get people emotionally embroiled in the moment so that they will stay in the game and that they will fear and be angry at and or hate the enemy in such a way that these people will stay in power. You know, it's a moment that um, it, it was in a sense long in coming. I remember, and I'm sure most of you do too, uh, not that long ago when uh, there were demands for town halls, right? Members of Congress that, that discussing um, healthcare among other things. And there were town halls that were being canceled and members of Congress who refused to meet with the public because there was such emotion involved in this topic that, that people, members of Congress were just some of them, were just saying, you know, no, you know what? No, I'm not, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna meet with them. I, I, I don't need to, you know, I'm, I'm doing my job. And at the time I remember thinking, you know, everyone doesn't have to have a town hall, but I'm not gonna meet with or talk to my constituents that's a problem, right? How, how are you going to know what your constituents want and represent it if you're uninterested in hearing what they have to say? Again, that gets back to what members of Congress are supposed to do versus what they choose to do. We're seeing some pretty extreme models of that now. Um, but I raise it because voting rights it is the game. Right. I mean, there are many, many things in which uh, components that we can point to and say, well, it, this is endangering democracy. This is endangering democracy. Voting rights is, is pretty fundamental. Right. If, if we don't have free and fair elections, if we don't have everyone who is eligible to vote, able to vote readily, easily, that's that's you know, really hitting at the essence of our system. But what those elections are doing is putting people in office who are supposed to represent us. He maybe gets very worked up about democracy. <laughs> Whenever I talk about democracy, he may be a history bird, but he's a democracy history bird. Very, thank you, newbie, for that commentary. Um, so I raise this today only because I think 
it's easy and logical right now to get so wrapped up in um, what's going on in Congress as far as the bills that we need or want to have passed, the protection of voting rights, and to forget to step back and actually think, what is it that our members of Congress are doing? Um, what is it that they are seeing as their mission? Um, how are they acting on that? What is their model of being a representative? And by that, I mean broadly a senator or a representative, someone who represents the people who put them there. What's their understanding of what they're supposed to be doing? It's never been absolutely cemented in time, but it's worth thinking about, particularly given that there are some people who very much see their job as, as playing to the base. Again, not new, but we're seeing it in some pretty extreme ways. I don't even necessarily have to go into detail about that for you all to have in mind some of what I'm talking about. Um, I saw gerrymandering sort of go floating across the bottom of the screen. And indeed, um, that's one way of many to tweak and alter and warp a uh, political system so that elections are warped, so that people are put into positions of power who are wanted to be there by people with power as opposed to who are truly represented by the masses. Again, things not being new, gerrymandering, uh, that goes all the way back. I think it was first used in, let me get the year here because I looked it up. Um, it was first used in the Boston Gazette uh, in 1812. Okay, so that it goes all the way back. And it was named indeed, oddly enough, after Elbridge Gerry. So it's gerrymandering in Elbridge Gerry. And I can't explain to you how those two things divided off. But the idea was um, at the time, Gerry was um, governor in Massachusetts um, and he um, oversaw and approved of a redistricting in Massachusetts that was, was worked positively for the Jeffersonian Republicans, and he was one of them, and that became known as gerrymandering. Um, so again, all the way back, nothing new that we're looking at here. But it's worth thinking about at this moment when democracy is being challenged, in some cases denounced or denied in a pretty explicit way, an extreme way, it's worth in this moment thinking about what our representatives, senators and representatives in Congress are supposed to be doing. Again, I, and I say this in one way or another, week after week after week here, it's so easy to take things for granted, um, to not stop and examine things, to not, for example, if you get angry at something, pause and think to yourself, are they trying to make me angry? Like is someone doing this to get me angry? And in that case, what's going on here? What's the purpose? What's the underlying logic? The same thing holds true, particularly I think right now with Congress because um, the people's branch, right? They're supposed to represent us members of Congress. What does that mean right now? What are they doing? How are they doing it? How are different people doing whatever it is they're doing in different ways? And what does that suggest about the working of democracy on that basic level? So voting rights and elections need to be at the center of our, our focus right now, representation is part of that. The, you know, pivot, when Madison used the word pivot, he very deliberately is talking about interwoven structures, right? And, and um, representation is the pivot, but it's surrounded by other structures. It's worth thinking about not just what Congress is or isn't doing, but what its members see as their duty or their responsibilities and how they're doing it. Important to think about that, again, on a local basis, assuming that we will continue to fight for free and fair elections locally, as well as nationally, worth thinking about what members of Congress are supposed to do, what they're actually doing, and what that says about the moment that we're in. In one way or another, and again, I know I say this week after week as well, democracy is under attack in many ways right now. And um, I'll use an excellent non 21st century word, it behooves us, it's a great word, it behooves us to think about what that means in a very specific way. What are we specifically seeing that is anti-democratic or undemocratic and the behavior of our members of Congress deserves to be examined and evaluated. There are our representatives. We have a right 
to want our representatives to behave in a certain way. And so I guess the overall point of what I want to say, I see I'm running out of time here. The overall point of what I want to say today is just that, yes, representation matters a lot, but what does it mean and how is it being enacted or not enacted right now? And what does that say about the health of our democracy or the unhealthiness of our democracy? Because that's a vital part of the equation. And I think it's an easily overlooked one. We focus on bills and not the people involved in trying to get them passed and what that says about the health of our democratic republic. Okay, I am going to stop there because I want time for questions. And yes, mug, but I, I'm programmed. I'm well programmed now with the mug. Um, although now that I've said that, I'll forget it. Um, anyone who is here and who is new um, every week for all 94 weeks, um, I, oh, look at that. We got gerrymandering happening behind, thank you, Grace. Yeah, I thought we needed the real one. Yeah, it, excellent. And I'm gonna come back to that in a moment, but um, every week there's a mug that relates to whatever it is we're talking about. Um, and this is an obvious one. It's my bug from the US Capitol. When I went there and, and um, met with uh, Tammy Duckworth for backstory, former podcast, uh, and then I needed a souvenir of the moment. So this one, this morning, as a matter of fact, when I was making the coffee that I'm not enjoying right now, I thought to myself, this is an easy, it's an easy mug day. Uh, the people's branch, the people need to be alert to what's happening there and decide what they think of it. Um, gerrymandering, so it gets called gerrymandering because supposedly the shape of that weird being that represented a district that was weirdly created is a salamander, right? The thought was that's a salamander and they decided it was a gerrymander, right? That some new creature based on Elbridge Gerry. Um, but that is indeed where the term comes from. Poor Elbridge Gerry gets to be the guy <laughs> eternally associated with that. Um, but yes, indeed. Excellent, excellent choice. If I had been thinking ahead of time, I could have even said I'm going to talk about gerrymandering and it could cue you. Well, in. I, I, I actually, I had initially looked at it and I thought, is she going to go gerrymandering? I'm not going to <laughs> exactly where she's going to go with this, but I can I don't find, think I find I a primary until, document yeah. in a hurry. That's all right. I don't think I knew um, until this morning when I was sitting down and figuring out what I was going to say. It was like, yeah, you, you got to have gerrymandering in there somewhere. Classic. My high schoolers always enjoyed this image. So it's an excellent image. Indeed. Well, we do have quite a lot of questions for you. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So Dale, Dale is suspecting the motives of Robert Morris. Um, it <laughs> says, wasn't he the gentleman who went broke on land speculation and ended up in debtor's prison? Wouldn't his money problems influence his desire for high pay? Well, indeed. So, you know, this is an interesting component in, um, I think probably teaching any kind of politics, but particularly founding era politics is um, students will be looking at or analyzing primary documents um, and trying to figure out what the person writing, again, probably elite white male means. And at, sooner or later, usually sooner, a student will say, well, how can we tell when they actually are meaning what they're saying or when they're saying it because it serves them somehow, or it's the right thing to, you know, how can we judge <laughs> what they're saying or doing? And the answer to that is, there is no one answer, but yeah, you have to think that way, right? You, you need to think about whatever rhetoric or whatever words it is that you're reading. And absolutely, Morris is a, you know, at the time was seen as a man of business. You know, he was a guy who was very much involved in one way or another with commerce and money and finance and trade. So part of what he was doing, could he have been standing up and even on a simpler level, thinking to himself, senators should be big deals and I want a lot of money as a senator. So let's get a lot of money. You know, what happened at that moment doesn't necessarily have to be a debate about ideology on a very broad level. However, whatever that the basis of Morris's comments were, it does get to that basic idea, which is, who are representatives supposed to be in relation to the people and that from the very beginning, they were still trying to figure this out. So the, the short answer is, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he is the guy, um, man of money, man of finance, known as that guy um, who gets very badly involved in land speculation, um, 
so yes. Uh, but is that the only reason why I think he said what he said? No, I think it's, I think yeah. it can be more than one thing. Sure. I think, yeah, we, we can't forget that they're human, but doesn't and mean I everything. forget that they're human. <laughs> Um, Gloria says, John Kennedy felt that a representative should think higher than his constituents, think for the country and persuade his constituents. Do you think this was an original thought by Madison? Interesting. Um, well, I do think, I don't, I don't know, I'm not going to necessarily peg it on Madison. I will say that there was an assumption that yes, the representatives and senators would go to Congress and act out the will and desire and needs of their constituents. And then an equal the equally important assumption that they would then go home and report to their constituents on what was happening and what they did and why they did what they did. Because yes, on the national stage, they would have a view of national affairs that no one else would have. Um, so for example, when Congress would go out of session, you, there are letters, they're actually not that difficult to find from people writing to other people and saying, I don't know what's happening on a national level. Like, I don't know what's happening outside of my area, really, because Congress is gone. And so there isn't that clearinghouse of information. So what's happening? I don't know what's happening. So part of what Congress is doing is representing and acting upon what they supposedly think their constituents want, but also they are expected to explain and even persuade to their constituents why they're doing what they're doing. McClay's diary was not intended to be a private document, which the word diary is misleading. He, he aimed, he, he assumed it was a public document. He um, wafered in or pasted in documents from Congress assuming, and he had it in his saddlebag, assuming, and he talks about this at some point, that he would go back to his constituents and he could show them, you know, here, look, I did this, and on this day I did this, and then there's this document. He saw that as a way of explaining to his constituents what he did, but also why he did it and why he was acting in the way that he did on a stage that his constituents would have no way really of understanding what was going on there other than what they were getting out of private letters and what ended up finding its way into the press. So I, I the, again, really long answer. The short yeah. answer, is, yeah. There's there's representation, and there also would have to be explanation, and I suppose which could end up being persuasion. Again, ideally speaking, right? The system would be you act and you do something, and you maybe it's not what your your constituents ask, and you try to persuade them that it's a good idea, and if they don't agree with you, then they throw you out of office, right? That's that's what the system's supposed to do. Uh, again, which is why free and fair elections are pretty essential for that that pivot to work. But yeah, I think that that is part of what was supposed to be going on. I, and you know, ideally, representatives were supposed to be able to think beyond themselves of a larger good. I don't think, and I've said this a lot of times before too. I don't think the founding generation, even though they're not a blob, uh, the unblob-like founding generation, I don't think they assumed that somehow or other representatives would be superhuman and would, you know be able to never think of themselves. They were not naive. Um, they might've been ambitious in a variety of good and bad ways. They were not naive, but that's part of why they were putting structures in motion because they were sort of assuming that the structures would help things work in the right direction or move in the right direction. And, or as Hamilton would have put it, channel passions in ways that would do the least damage. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, Miranda wants to know, um, gerrymandering exists, we know it does, um, and has existed throughout history. Uh, so how do we now and how have people fought the this hopelessness and frustration when gerrymandering is so great that, that a person might realize that their vote literally doesn't matter? How, how do they work through that? How have they worked through that? Boy, wouldn't it be nice if there was legislation that made that difficult? <laughs> Um, you know, there have been, when you look at um, political like behavior during, just before and during elections, again, you know, from the founding period on, you see all kinds of really shady behavior on the part of people who want power, you know, and whether that's politicos or people acting behind the scenes or people with power themselves, you know, I've talked before about elections in the early republic and um i think it's actually pennsylvania where um people were writing up 
ballots, pre, you know, pre written ballots and handing them to people like, here you go, like, here's the ballot, hand this in. Ready, checked, boxes, excellent. That was, you know, for one party and not for another party. There were en endless maneuvers going on at the time to try and get people to act along the lines of how political politicos uh, wanted you to act in one way or another. Um, you know, is there one simple answer? Like, should we work against gerrymandering? Yes. Is it always a problem? Yes. Are there always ways, you know, over the long haul, you can see um, one party will be in power and do something to warp the system and then it'll flip and someone else will be in power and then they'll do something to flip the system. That's, that's long standing. The question is, and that's this question being asked here, what do we do about that? Can we have legislation nationally and or locally that says that kind of strategic and um, exceedingly unfair mode of districting, which deliberately silences some people and gives other people more of a voice, that that can't be allowed, right? That, that, that boils down to what our representatives are doing, right? Locally and nationally. If we don't like gerrymandering, wouldn't it be nice if, if people in power could act on that um, and stand up for that uh, in some way in big numbers? Uh, sometimes in the past, there have been moments where people have been able to be bipartisan on certain key issues, like anything having to do with voting, that they could see that this has to do with the fundamental functioning of our republic. <laughs> now might not be one of those moments. But yeah, legislation which should be nice to prevent it from happening as blatantly. Again, we're talking politics and power and money. Um, and so there's always going to be... Um, I think Jefferson once uses the word twistifications. Um, there's, I think he, I, I think he does, and, and, and as president, the twistifications. Um, there's always going to be that going on in politics. The question is, um, do we just sit back and allow it, or do we at least highlight it and spotlight it, and then try to act to at least better it, if not prevent it? Wow, that's fascinating, and I'm just glad to know that Thomas Jefferson also made up words. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love when people make up words. Um, yes. Andrew Jackson, not not a fave, but he made up words all the time. And I always, I, that is a thing I appreciate just as a historian, because if they're making up words in and of itself, they're saying something that, you know, your your historian antenna go up. Oh, they needed a word to say this thing. And so what does that mean? Justifications is just an excellent political word. It is indeed. Um, so, so Dale wants to know, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly what time period we're talking about here, and do continue to put in questions here, particularly historical questions. We have lots of um, modern discussion as well, which is of course relevant, but do get us the historical questions as well. Um, Dale wants to know how the perceived qualifications to run for Congress changed over the years. Uh, whether it, he, he says it sort of starts as a gentleman of character and does that shift more to appealing to a base, thinking about regional divisions? How do those qualifications shift over time? You've looked at both really early, early America and a little later in the 30s. You're right. Well, I mean, I would say um, to answer it in a slightly different way, do people look for different things at, at different times in their representatives? Yes. Um, and so, yes, there was you know, you can claim that at the early period, supposedly what was happening was people were looking for um, people who could think of a larger good, but we're talking humans and politics. So of course they were thinking about other things necessarily than the, the larger good, but you know, at different moments in time, um, like the period in the book that I most recently wrote, um, depending on where you were in the union, you might want a representative who just is a powerful, loud, aggressive, angry guy, because that kind of guy is going to get a lot done in Congress because he will be able to scare people, right? That kind of person got a lot of power. And on just a purely strategic level, it was useful to have that kind of guy represent you. So, so have the the models of being a representative changed over time? Sure. And even in the most obvious way, you know, the 117th Congress is the most diverse Congress. It's still mightily unrepresentative of who we are as a nation, but it is the most diverse amidst many Congresses that were really not very diverse of those that have come along yet. So 
you could say that that's another answer to the question of what how we envision or what we expect our representatives to be. In some cases, we are actually saying, not only do I want my representative to represent me, but many others feel the same way and we're gonna act on that or run for office in one way or another and change the nature of representation. You know, that's an interesting question, um, which I, I can't really go into now and I would have to do some um, pre history matters thinking about it, but the, the fundamental question, I'm sure people have written about it in a contemporary context, the fundamental question about what it does to change the nature of congressional dynamics and dealings when you have a, a more diverse Congress, when you have more women present in Congress, um, that's a really interesting question, right? And there's all kinds of, you know, people pundits talking about how well, women tend to work well together. So maybe that'll change something about the nature of Congress. I don't know, but it's worth thinking about as a thinking as a, as a historian and probably there are political scientists doing this, even as we sit here, um, thinking about what the, how the dynamics of Congress shift based on the nature of the people sitting in Congress and in particular um, women uh, and people of color of all kinds and just the fact that there are greater numbers now than there have ever been, that's gotta have a, a, an impact. A lot of that impact I would assume would be positive. Some of it's gotta be negative because there's gonna be resistance or anger or um, in one way or another trying to block that off. Um, and we're kind of in that moment more broadly than Congress, but that's kind of where we are right now, politically speaking, is um, people trying to silence some voices for the sake of power. I will stop right there and not say anything more, but that is indeed what we are seeing. Thank you. Um, Richard says that Teddy Roosevelt called the economic elite robber barons the malefactors of wealth. So what are the ways in the past? Has this been an issue? We know that we Teddy Roosevelt was was active, trust busting. Were there, were there actions that were taken to restrain the power of wealth in Congress before that? Um, are particular that you'd like to focus on? Are there things that could continue to be done to limit the power of wealth in Congress? Well, that certainly was, was if you go and rummage around in the Federalist essays, and I will say they're not called the Federalist Papers. Oh. That's like modern, made up. They were called the Federalist. That's it. I don't That's... know what papers came along, but but it's not, they're not called the Federal Papers. Um, so the Federalist essays, if you look in there, as a matter of fact, I think even in the one I was looking at for today, number 63, I believe, Madison writes about the fact that um, wealth being unevenly distributed uh, is a major cause of, of problem, right? That that's in and of itself is gonna cause a problem in representation. So from the beginning, I think there was a realization that that very fundamental thing, certainly not in ways that we see it now, experience it now and, and assume that it exists now, but still the idea of um, wealth differentials mattered. Hmm. It, they also were dealt with. I mean, this is part of what made one of the many reasons why Hamilton was so controversial, right? Hamilton came forward when it came to men of money and particularly men and said, you know, yeah, I know these guys, they're speculating and doing whatever they're doing and they have a lot of money and I know, but we need those sorts of people to be invested literally and figuratively in the government, the new government. It's useful to get their interest involved, right? Bank of the United States is gonna be useful for the new government. It's gonna allow the government to do all kinds of interesting, useful, important things, managing money. And then wealthy men can invest in it and thereby invest in the government and better themselves, their financial dealings at the same time. So it's forever the issue um, in Congress and outside of Congress, what do you do when you have some very wealthy people and then many, many, many people who are not wealthy, for some, the answer was, okay, well, that's the way it is. So let's do things to attract the really wealthy people so that they get what they want and support us. That hardly sounds like an old, out of date idea, doesn't it? That you can, you can look at your watch and count the last time you saw that in action. That's, that's a political strategy, potentially an ugly political strategy, but it certainly is a tried and true political strategy. All right, thank you. That's, that's very interesting. 
Um, Jean says, we talk about gerrymandering, but not about closed primaries and horse race voting. It seems like open primaries and ranked choice or star voting would help. Um, thoughts? Now, of course, this is, again, it's sort of a modern discussion. But when do we see people starting to say things like this um, when, when they're thinking about the fair ways to have districts? Well, I mean, in the same way that you can go all the way back in time and see people manipulating elections to get specific kinds of representatives in office, you can see people try, grappling with what should be happening, what is happening, how to make things happen. And in very often, again, seems really modern, but it's not necessarily modern, using seemingly democratic practices in cagey ways to suggest that you're doing something based on what the people want and you're actually not. An extreme example of this is um, early 19th century. Um, there is, I believe it's in New York, um, the, the, I believe it's the Jeffersonian Republicans in New York are creating a slate of um, electors of some kind. Uh, and they understand that the public wants to feel that they are involved. They don't want just elite people, right? Democratic Republicans are for more public engagement in the ongoing process of politics. So they hold um, a, a kind of convention, a, a big public meeting in New York and claim like we're gonna elect, we're gonna decide on a slate of electors here as a group and you will vote and we will take your votes and tabulate them and come back and announce who the slate of electors is, which sounds so wonderfully democratic, right? That's what should be happening. The people coming together and voting and together coming up with some kind of a, a ticket of some kind, a slate of electors. What actually happened in this case was a bunch of high ranking politicos met before the convention and came up with the ticket that they wanted. They went through this whole rigmarole in public and then went away and came back and reported what they already had decided before anyone said anything. And of course, nobody knew that their votes didn't count at all. It was like a bow in the direction of, look at us, we're being really small d democratic and the public matters. Like, no, they don't, but we bowed in that general direction so that we acted as though we were being democratic. That's part of the equation too here. Um, and that's part of the current moment is more generally in the past, People might be trying to manipulate the system in ways that are strategic, but they at least um, couch them in democratic language and customs. Some of what we're seeing now seemingly is not even bothering with that anymore. Um, and I'm, I won't go back into the democracies under threat um, rant that I often go on, but, but that indeed is, is part of what we're seeing now. Uh, in the way that people are not necessarily bowing towards, at least bowing towards, if not staying true to the tenets and the um, responsibilities of, of a functional democracy. Thank you. Um, when we look at when we look at representation, there there are actually a lot that happens because of rounding. Because of the way the way that districts are divided, some some states you you end up rounding up or rounding down. So there actually is kind of a, a disconnect in, in political power, which is a strange thing. Are you able to speak about how how I know Franklin was involved and Jefferson was involved? How did they actually figure out the math of the districts? Do you know? Any, have you could come across anything about that in your in your work? Yeah, I actually don't, um, or certainly in the recent past, have not focused on that in a way that's going to let me say that intelligently, intelligently you're right, that, that the math matters immensely. Um, but I would have to go rummage around a little bit before answering that question. And I don't, I don't want to plunge in without doing that, because I'm going to say something very goofy if I, <laughs> if I give it a try. And I'll have said something very goofy that's being recorded. So um, <laughs> I would rather I would rather rummage around and come back with the answer to that. But but you're right. I mean, that's also why, you know, for example, the census is so important. Yeah. Messing with the census is so significant, right? That also is part of the equation of representation, among other things. Yeah. Thank you. That That's something that uh, I've been wondering about myself. So I want to make rummaging. you say be on camera. Rummaging. Yeah, rummaging. We need to do some rummaging. Well, is, is there anything else just in the discussions 
of congressional representation and the way that districts work. Has there been anything else noteworthy that you've come across in the primary documents that you find that we don't talk about when we're discussing these things in modern discourse? About representation? Yeah. Generally in, in primary documents from the- Yeah, there are things that we, we miss in this discussion. Well, I mean, I don't know if we miss it, but um, it's something I certainly think about when I'm thinking about what representation means. Um, and that is, you know, in the, the world of the founding, the very different world of the founding, there was a, an assumption that more often than not, you knew the people who you were putting into office, right? It's a smaller world. Um, and it was important. There had to be, particularly in the South, there had to be mingling between people running for office and the public. But, you know, I, I think sometimes there's a, um, let's say constitution mindedness, paper document mindedness um, in the colonies because colonies were created very often with something on paper that created that colony and colonies were small and people tended to know the people in power in a certain way. And so there was very much an assumption that you know you could see on paper where how your political entity came to be and what it was meant to be for and you knew who was representing you or in one way or another and you could make demands on them in a very personal way there was a way a, a personal component to representation that you know is long gone but that affected enormously how people thought representation should work and that it's easy again to forget about because that's a that's an alien world that's a world we no longer have but hmm. it was part of that equation an important part of that equation great well so tim wants to know you mentioned the census um are there instances in the early history where attempts were made to manipulate the census i do not know the answer to that okay um it's a really good question. I would be stunned if there has never ever been an attempt <laughs> ever in US history to, to manipulate the census. Um, but I don't have a specific answer to that. So that is my general historian answer to that. Question. I'll look it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly, there must be more rummaging uh, involved. Uh, I, and I would rather say I don't know than make something up and then feel guilty all day that I made something up and. So I, I will say, like a good teacher, I don't know, but, but I can come back with the answer. You know what, Joanne, we probably would have believed you and it would have been fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I would know. <laughs> but I, I do know. I yeah. have to say, when I, when I was teaching high school, you know, I, I taught about the census when I was teaching AP Gov, but I, I don't think I thought much about the early census. So I, it, that's something I would like to look into more as well. So thank and you, why it's you for bringing that up, Tim. Right. I mean, it why, is important. Why it's fundamentally important. I mean, um, back when we were last talking about a census being messed with. Um, and there I was on Twitter saying, you know, the census is really important. It has to do with representation. It has to do with money being given out in certain ways for certain groups of people. It's pretty fundamental. And there were press outlets that were like, could you just explain to us why the census is important? And I realized, wait, this is like a thing that people are supposed to know. Like, how am I the person weighing in on this? And all I've said is, it's important for the distribution of resources and for representation. That's not a profound idea. And somehow people were like, huh. But that's another one of those things, like so many things that we talk about on, on History Matters that you don't think about. It's just like, this happens every 10 years, census, blah, 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 until there's tweaking of it. And then suddenly you're like, wait a minute, what is this actually doing? It's part of what, what I want us to do based on these conversations is to pause and think about things that we took for granted and we're at a moment where you really can't take a lot for granted um, right now that it, it, it once again behooves us to be hyper vigilant about what's going on around us. I see we are kind of out of time. Yes, and part um, of that vigilance is knowing about our past. It, so It is, it is. Um, we must be, that's right. Well, and I've talked about that before too, right? How people like good old Thomas Jefferson felt it was important to teach history because if you understood history, you would recognize threats to the Republic because you would understand how that happened in the past. History is important. History matters. <laughs> I know it's so unique and original to me to come up with that, but I'm not fully caffeinated yet. At any rate, um, I do, as always, uh, want to thank you guys for coming and being part of this uh, wonderful community that we are have formed for 94 now weeks uh, and for taking part in this kind of conversation. 
which is the nuts and bolts of democracy, being able to get together and talk about things like this and pull them apart and figure out how they work and come up with things that we think aren't working well and think about ways to make them work better. Thank you for that. Um, if you, we are now gonna segue into the after party. For those of you who might be new, um, the after party means we are no longer recording what's going on so that we can be a little freer and easier with what we say. Uh, and if you have beamed in here through the National Council for History Education website, nchetech.org slash conversations, just stay right where you are. And I know it's on bingo cards. These people are playing bingo and poof, we will be the after party. If you are beaming in through Facebook, you will need to leave Facebook. And if you want to be part of the after party, join us through nchetech.org slash conversations. Uh, and with that, I will say, um, as ever, Grace, thank you very much for being here and to NCHE for sponsoring this program. And I will come up with a 95th topic <laughs> next week. I will. And it'll be All a right. good one, too. It'll be a good one, whatever it is. I don't know, but it'll be good. It will be great. We're excited for it. Thank you all for being here with us on uh, History Matters, and so does coffee. Please join us again here next week and check us out at nchetech.org. Thanks so much.